All right, family, we're going to go ahead and get started with our Hunger and Thirst for Righteousness class today. Um, today, we'll be talking about the title of this lesson is Nothing More and Nothing Less. Nothing More, Nothing Less. And so this is a really good um, talk, of, <laughs> a really, really good talk. When I say a really, really good talk, a really, really good talk. And um, obviously, and well, not obviously, but in this class in Hunger and Thirst for Righteousness, we are in First Samuel right now. And so we'll go ahead and start getting to the reading. I don't have to do too much talking. I'll let the word talk for itself. As you know, if you've listened in before, and so let's go ahead and get going. So 1 Samuel 13, 6 and 7 says, When the men of Israel saw that they were in a strait, for their people were hard pressed, then the people hid themselves in caves, in thickets, in cliffs, in cellars, and in pits. Also, some of the Hebrews crossed the Jordan into the land of Gad and Gilead. But as for Saul, he was still in Gigal, and all the people followed him trembling. All the people followed him trembling. Let's keep going. Eight to nine, it says, now he waited seven days according to the appointed time set by Samuel. But Samuel did not come to Gilgal and the people were scattering from him. So Saul said, bring to me the burnt offering and the peace offerings. And he offered the burnt offering. And so in this in this time, I'm, I'm explaining a little bit what's going on. Um, so basically, he waited seven days. He waited because Samuel had told him basically this instruction from God to wait for seven days for Samuel to get there. And then he was going to do this offering. And, and that basically was going to be their way of just um, solidifying the deal and being obedient to God and what they were doing. Right. And so he's waiting for Samuel. Samuel does not show up in that seven days. So when he doesn't show up, though, Saul decides that, well, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and do what Samuel was going to do. And so Saul says, bring to me the burnt offering and the peace offerings. And he offered the burnt offering. And so he went ahead and did what, what, what Samuel was supposed to do. He was never told to do this. And says, as soon as he finished offering the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came and Saul went out to meet him and to greet him. But Samuel said, what have you done? And Saul said, because I saw that the people were scattering from me and that you did not come within the appointed days, that the Philistines were assembling to uh, mishmash. Uh, well, therefore, I said, now the Philistines will come down against me at Gigal, and I have not asked the favor of the Lord. So I forced myself and offered the burnt offering. And so, like he said, he's given me all these reasons as to why he did what he did. But his reason is not because God told him to do it. And at the end, he literally says, so I forced myself and offered the burnt offering. So I forced myself and offered the burnt offering. And so we're, we're going to talk about this more and more. And we're nowhere near done with this lesson. I got a, a lot of slides to talk to as we go through this. But I want you to take notice about Saul giving his why. What was his why? And it's the thing is that he, he's giving an offering. And all, like these offerings are things that is it, it, saying this word that God wants. He likes, right? He's doing what he's, he believes that God wants. But his why, though, his why wasn't because God told him to do what he wanted to do. His why that he did it was because of all these other factors of, of information, because I saw the people that were scattering from me. So he feared because the people were, were leaving his side. And that you did not come with the appointed day. So, and because of what you did. So one of his reasons was because of people not supporting him and people not being around him that he did what he did. His second reason was because he, he blamed Samuel that because you weren't where you're supposed to be is why I did what I did. And then the last thing he said, then, then the Philistines were assuming to mishmash. Therefore, I said, so he said, now all these reasons of why, but not one reason is because God told him to do it. And the reality is, is that these burnt offerings, like I said, when, when commanded by God, it was what he told them to do. But he did not tell Saul to do this. And now some of us have to understand that there are, there are things that you know and you may believe that, that God wants you to do in your life. But if it did not come through his word of order for you to do, you are wrong in the situation. You're wrong. And so let me keep going real quick. So it says, um, so now the Philistines will come down against me a giga. I have not asked the favor of the Lord. So I forced myself and offered the, the burnt offering. He forced himself and offered the burnt offering. Let's keep going into this a little bit. We got a lot to talk about with this. A lot to talk about with this. 
It says, Samuel said to Saul, you have acted foolishly. You have not kept the commandment of the Lord your God, which he commanded you. For now the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever, but now your kingdom shall not endure. The Lord has sought out for himself a man after his own heart, and the Lord has appointed him as ruler over his people because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. And so literally, um, and then, like I said, he, he offered a burnt offering. He, he's offering an offering that in general, these priests and these people did that was good to God. But he was not commanded to do this. He was not commanded to do this. He did not receive word from God in command to do this in his life. And so we understand that, you know, there are certain things that some people may be led by God through his word to do. But what were you led to do? Your walk is not the same as somebody else's walk. And you have to be obedient to what he's telling you to do from his word. Just because someone else is doing it and just because a, a maybe a whole congregation of somebody is doing something uh, for God. But did he tell you to do that? Did he tell you to do that? And so you understand that Saul was just anointed to be the king over Israel. He was anointed to be this leader from God. And that quickly, when I say that quickly, this is like two or three chapters. That quickly, the Lord has already said, you will not be my, my one that leads my people. Simply because he was not willing to just stay in line with what the word of God was telling him. And what you have to understand is this is that the word, the word was telling him to be in a certain place to wait for Samuel to get there. So he can do the offering um, and, and ask for favor of the Lord against these Philistines, right? But what we have to understand is that even if the Lord gives you direction, and even if things don't look like in your life like it's 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 coming in line with what he said do, even if it looks like, oh, I have no other direction, I don't know what to do, then be still then. You don't have to do anything. If the Lord is giving you instruction, he's giving you word of what to do in your life. And you come to a point in your life where you're like, oh, well, Lord, everything that's around me, I, I'm not seeing. I'm not seeing clearly uh, 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 the things should be forming around me to do what you told me to do. Then sit still. Then that doesn't mean just rush and do something. It means sit still. Sit still. Until you're able to be, to, to, to walk in the fullness of obedience of his word. Sit still. It's better to do nothing than to move in disobedience. Patience is a fruit of the spirit and there is no law against it. It's okay to be patient. But it's not okay to rush. And so we'll get into this more and more. Like I said, I got many things. To say about this is going to be a very good lesson. We'll get into it. Let's keep going. We were just in Samuel. So now we are, you we already know if you, if you listen to this talk, we're going to go into Jesus. And so here we are with Jesus who, who really exemplifies the, the same message. The same message. It's, it's the same message because Jesus is Lord. He's never changed. It's, it's the same message. So here he is in Luke 10, 38 to 40. Now, as they were traveling along, he entered the village and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister called Mary, who was seated at the Lord's feet, listening to his word. But Martha was distracted with all her preparations. And she came up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the serving alone? Then tell her to help me. And so I'm going to go ahead and keep reading. But I want you to keep notice real quick what is going on. So he comes into this, this woman's home. Mary, the sister, is at the Lord's feet, listening to his word. But Martha was distracted with all her preparations. And so her preparations could be like she's in the house and she's cooking a meal. She's trying to make a feast for the Lord, right? She's trying to, she's doing something that she believes to be right for God right now. Just like Saul. Just like Saul. He was doing something that he believed to do right by God. You cannot, there's nothing you can even think to do right by God, but listen to him. But let's keep going because this is what Jesus is going to say. But the Lord answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and bothered about so many things. But only one thing is necessary for Mary has chosen the good part, which should not be taken away from her. Mary has chosen the good part. Only one thing is necessary. No, listen to this. She's worried about so many things. 
But the Lord literally says only one thing is necessary. And Mary has chosen the good part. What did Mary choose to do? Mary chose to sit at the Lord's feet and listen to his words. There's only one thing necessary. And that's to listen to his word. And we have to understand that you, you can perceive in your heart all day that, oh, this is a good thing I can do for God. Oh, this is a good thing I can do for God. There is you can you cannot think of anything good enough to do for God, but be obedient to his word. There's nothing you can do. You can decide I'm just going to give away everything. I'm going to I'm going to go go downtown and feed the homeless. I'm going to um, I'm going to uh, uh, do this event uh, uh, for young people. I'm going to whatever it is. There's nothing you can do that's good enough for God. But, but but to be obedient to his word. And it's the only thing necessary to be to do right by him. There's only one thing necessary. And Mary has chosen the good part, which shall not be taken away from her. Shall not be taken away from her. She chose the good part, sitting and listening to the word of God. So now in Isaiah 55, 8, this goes back into what I'm saying is that he says, my thoughts are not your thoughts nor are your ways my ways. And so you may be, you may think that, oh yeah, if, if, if God shows up, I should definitely just, just cook him a big meal. But guess what? Your thoughts are not his thoughts and your ways are not his ways. And so the things that you think are good, the, the ways you think are good are not true to, to him. It's actually direct opposite for real in his life of what he believes is right and what we believe is right and what he believes is wrong, what we believe is wrong is, is directly contrary, to be honest with you. And so we understand that there is no thought that we can have that's good enough that, that just says like, oh, I'm going to do this good thing for God. It's not a good enough thought. It's not good. And so Jeremiah 4, um, 22 says, Jeremiah 4, 22, it says, for my people are foolish. They know me not. They are stupid children and have no understanding. They are sure to do evil, but to do good, they do not know. And so I'm just going to focus on the last part of the scripture. But to do good, they do not know. He's literally saying that within your flesh, you have no knowledge of how to do good. You're not able to just think of, oh, I'm going to do this good for God. It's not going to be good enough because it's not good to him. You have no knowledge of good within, within you. Paul literally says that he said, although I want to do the things that are good, my flesh is, does not allow me to do those things because there's nothing good within your flesh. You cannot have a good enough thought. You have no knowledge of good. Whatever. I'm, I'm telling you the truth right now. That's what Jesus literally said. They came to him and said, a good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And he said, why do you call me good? Only one is good. and That's God alone. And so we have to understand that we are not good. And even down to who we are, our brains, our minds, our flesh, our brains, part of our, our flesh, our thoughts. You cannot have a good enough thought for God. Which, means, which brings me down to this. Which this further explains and, and, and gives you a better understanding of just even more so why there's nothing good you can do for real from your flesh, your own thoughts. Like the only good thing you can do is listen to what he's saying to you. It says Galatians 5, 19, 21, now the deeds of the flesh, the deeds of the flesh. So these are the things that the flesh does and there's no other way around it. Like these are the only options of what our flesh does for real. These are the things that our thoughts are, are based in. These are the things that our ways are based in. They're all based in immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these, of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. And so you have to understand that as flesh, these things are usually our wise behind all of our thoughts. They're our wise behind our actions. But understand that none of these whys are good enough to God in your life. There is nothing you can do as a fleshly human being to do right by God by your own action. 
The only thing that you can do is be obedient. The only thing you can do is have faith. Which brings me to this is Romans 10, 17 says, so faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. You have to understand that you can believe that you're doing things out of faith all day, but if it's not coming from his word, it's not real faith. It's not faith. Faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. Faith is, well, well this thing is that you believe that, that faith is just, oh, I'm stepping out on faith and I'm doing this. But that's when you're not you're not serving the true and living God, because in the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God. And so to have faith in God, to have faith in his word, because he is his word. In the, the, in the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God. John 1, 1. Come on, right in front of your face. And so it's impossible to have faith in God. It's impossible to have faith in God and not have faith in his word. There is no faith in God. Without obedience to his word. John 3 36 says this. He who believes in the son has eternal life. But he who does not obey the son will not see life. But the wrath of God abides on him. This is the truth. This is the truth. And so this is the thing is that you believe in the son. He, he has offered you eternal life. You have eternal life. But if you don't obey him, you will never see that life. Because the wrath of God abides on you. Abides on you. And so you know, like, I'm, like I'm trying to tell you is that there is nothing right you can do for God. There is no even saving of you unless by obedience to his word. That's something you have to accept and understand in your life. Is that there's nothing you can do good enough but be obedient to the son of God. And so here we are in James and we're, we're coming down the line, we're coming down the line. I got like uh, five more scriptures sets for you. We'll be done for the day. So we'll read a little bit out of James and James two, because he really says some really good things um, in this. And so it says, um, James two, uh, 18 and 20 says, but someone, someone may well say you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without the works and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one. You do well. The demons also believe and shudder. But are you willing to recon recognize, you foolish fellow, that faith without works is useless? Come on now, this is the truth. And it's crazy because this is something I really came to understand through the Gospels of Christ. And James just verified it for me. Then just understand this. Even the demons in the Gospel uh, pointed out that Jesus was a son of God. But just understand that faith without works is useless. Useless. The demons know that, 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 that there is one God. Demons know that Jesus is the son of God. What makes demons different from angels? It's obedience to the word of God. And so what makes you different than a demon? It's your obedience to the word of God. And so then here it says, the next thing he keeps going, was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up Isaac his son on the altar? You see that faith was working with his works. And as a result of the works, faith was perfected. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, um, and, a, and a Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to, reckoned to him as righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. You see the man is justified by works and not by faith alone. And see, so you understand that faith without works is dead. Just like Abraham received the word of God and he moved in obedience in his life and it was reckoned as righteousness, so is the same as, as you. There is no, no, you're, you will not be accredited as righteous in your life unless you receive the word of God and believe in faith and move off that word of God. That's faith. And there is no faith without works. It's like this. If he's telling you to, to love, he's telling you that his command of God it's to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. We can understand something then. Lo to love your neighbor is a work in life. It's a command. And if you're really having faith in what he's saying, you're going to love. Now, people, there, there are people who, who, who wish, you wish that it was more, you could be more lazy for God. You really wish that. But it's not that in this life. Is that you receive the word and have faith. And you move off of it. And then that accredits you as righteousness. 
If you're denying the word of God, it's wickedness. And you'll never be seen as righteous in God's eyes, no matter how much you believe the, uh, 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 that Jesus is going to magically make you appear as righteous. No, it's not. His word will if you're obedient to it. And so this is the last little passage we're going to read with John 8. And this is actually a very important to understand in your life because this obedience is obedience to Christ and nobody else that's going to credit you as righteous. And that's the truth. So it says, so Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed him, if you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine and you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. They answered him, we are Abraham's descendants and have never yet been enslaved to anyone. How is that you say you will become free? And so in this situation, he says, if you continue in my word, this is Jesus, my word, then you are truly disciples of mine. And you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. Only this truth can only be given through Jesus Christ. And it says if you continue in my word. My word. He didn't say just believe that I die on the cross. If you continue in my word, then you are my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. There is no freedom without continuing in his word. You can walk around all day saying, oh, uh, uh, you know, I've, I'm free because because Jesus says I'm free. If you're not abiding in his word, you don't know what freedom is. And so they answered him, we are Abraham's descendants and have never yet been enslaved to anyone. How's that you say you will become free? Um, and then so he says, and he continues on, J Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is the slave of sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son does remain forever. So if the son makes you free. You will be free indeed. And so you have to understand that, that, that Jesus frees you from sin in your life by binding you to righteousness. Because when you move in righteousness, you can't do something in righteousness and in sin at the same time. And so if you abide in his word, who is righteousness, it's not possible to sin if you're choosing his words as your why. If every step of the way you are choosing his word, there is no darkness in him at all. And he is righteousness. And so that's why he says everyone who commits sin is a slave of sin. But he also says that he is freeing people. And so you understand that your, your whole life, you should not be saying that, oh, I'm a sinner. Oh, I commit sin. I do this. I do that. No, because he, he frees you from sin by binding you to righteousness, which is in the truth. And so let's keep going. I know that you are Abraham's descendants, yet you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. I speak the things which I have seen with my father. Therefore, you also do the things which you heard from your father. And so he's literally saying that this word I give you are things that I, I have seen with my father. I've seen with my father. There's no one else that can say this to you. That the words that he's speaking, the things he's giving you are directly from the sight of his father and the words of his father's mouth. There's nobody else that can say that. Not even in this Bible or in this world. It's not possible. And then so last, this will be our last slide and we'll be done for the day. Um, it says, they answered and said to him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, do the deeds of Abraham. But, but as it is, you are seeking to kill me, a man who has told you the truth, which I heard from God, this Abraham did not do. And this is the craziest thing in the world. When I said this, this, this scripture really hit me hard this morning when I was reading it. Because he's literally saying, I, am, I have come and told you the truth. A man who has told you the truth, which I heard from God. He's saying, listen, I'm telling you the truth and I heard it from God. And he says, this Abraham did not do. He's saying, hold on. Abraham, yes, Abraham received the word from God, but he did not receive the truth straight from God as I did. Abraham did not have this, what I have. And so I'm here to tell you today, Abraham didn't have it. Uh, Jacob didn't have it. Um, Joseph didn't have it. Moses didn't have it. Um, who, who else didn't have it? David didn't have it. Solomon didn't have it. Isaiah didn't have it. Jeremiah didn't have it. None of these people had it. Jesus has it. And this is why we have to understand that it's very important in your life. To, to, to commit yourself to obedience to his word because he's the only one that actually has his word and truth. And so it's very important as he said that true words will worship in spirit and truth. If you're not being obedient to his word, you can't, to Jesus Christ's words, you cannot, um, you cannot um, worship him in spirit and truth 
because he's the only one who has the truth. And so the, the, the point of this message was to understand what it means to do right by God. And it's nothing more, nothing less. You cannot try to think, oh, what more can I do? What more can I do? What more can I do? Stop thinking and just be obedient to the things he's told you to do and do nothing more. But also make sure you're doing nothing less than what he's revealed to you through his word to do. And so that's what I have for you today. Nothing more, nothing less. We'll be back on here um, Sunday for our Sunday sermon. We'll probably be doing around 9 a.m. I uh, hope that everyone's having a blessed day and this lesson blessed you. Uh, have a blessed day.